All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today, we're going to talk about the cases and the situation in Europe, Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Let's start with a couple of comments, which I just saw while we were waiting. This comment is uh, actually an interesting comment from Robert. So thank you, Robert, for sharing it. Hi, Dr. Bean, just an announcement. My aunt, aunt in Jakarta got COVID after second two times vaccinated with Sinovac. So that is, I think, the sad part. And I do not know if she was reached protected but still she was vaccinated and the hospital in jakarta treats her with ivermectin remdesivir methylprednisolone just like math plus protocol so i love this and thank you very much uh, robert for sharing it i hope she recovers fast and uh, please keep us up up to date it would be interesting to know how this cocktail is working so uh, this is a good news then there is a comment here and we'll go back to the uh, some of the news i wanted to share before we do more questions so there is a question by ab movement uh, question took ivermectin for two weeks for for long COVID, no improvement any thoughts should i try the vaccine i'm so tired of being sick thank you for your time and knowledge so ab moment at the end of the day it needs to be understood that what is causing it so the cocktail of the possibilities that various cool beans so anecdotal not a study various cool beans have reported what helped them i'm going to list them out here and we can actually talk about what is the logic behind each one of them and what does it rule in or rule out at a separate time. But here what we have seen so far is the following. Some long haulers respond very well to ivermectin. Some do not. Um, some long haulers I've seen were actually receiving lower doses of ivermectin. So that is why they were not responding. So one full therapeutic dose per week has been suggested by many doctors. Then uh, some long haulers who had neurological symptoms responded very well to fluvoxamine. On the other hand, some long haulers, actually one at least, reached out to me directly. He's a nurse practitioner, research worker as well in New York, who said taking fluvoxamine increased my tinnitus after the vaccine, not the long hauling, but he had developed it after the vaccine. Uh, and then he said antihistamine helped them. Then uh, there, there was a long hauler who commented that nothing worked or helped them until they took interferons. And after interferons, the uh, long haul state went away. My own experience with my patients, steroid therapy, low dose steroid therapy has been very, very helpful. Then um, the other possibilities are vaccine as well. So there has been one long hauler who said, that after taking vaccine, their long haul symptoms went away like magic. So that means there is a lot more to be discussed. For example, is it a mast cell activation syndrome? Is this the virus sitting somewhere dormant in the body and bothering the immune system? Is this a hit and try, uh, sorry, hit and run a mechanism of the virus where the immune, some of the immune cells have become incorrectly trained to respond at a higher state. So depending upon the un underlying reason is the treatment. So what happens is that doctors should try to go over this ladder of treatment possibilities and that wherever the patient starts becoming improved, that tells which direction they should then focus and that tells what may be the underlying pathology. On the other hand, uh, I would also add that Dr. Bruce Patterson and Dr. Yeo, I have no financial interests with them or any other kind of interest which would make my discussion <clears throat> biased, I'm sorry. Uh, they have been working on the long hauling for some time as well, and they have a test kit as well. So I think that may be useful as well for some folks. So having said that, I want you to quickly do a uh, news roundup and then we'll go back to the questions. So please uh, bear with me for a second. Hey, Colin, how are you? So this is drbean.com. I want to go over this. I have been saying that India's use of ivermectin is not very clear to me. So some of the India's um, cool beans have been uh, then reporting to me that ivermectin has been used. Some in a more decent way, sending me links and saying, hey, look at it. Some becoming angry that somehow I'm doing a, a propaganda, whatever. Uh, the point is really to understand if ivermectin is being used. If not, then it should be used. 
and what is the effect of it. So we'll discuss this as well. Um, then here, this is the Bloomberg's uh, vaccine tracker. And if you see here, one of the one of the top countries, Seychelles and Israel, are there. So we'll we'll look into that data after talking a little bit about is uh, India. Israel's data very good uh, results here, and I'm so proud and grateful to David from Israel, who who actually is now actually San Jose based. So David from US, my neighbor. He was here yesterday and translated us the, the Hebrew, Hebrew part of the data. So cases are down really good, 2,191 down. I think they have reached almost, look at this, 2,191 in June and then 2,191 in April. So they have reached the, the second lowest or the lowest they have achieved while during the pandemic. So that is awesome. And I would suspect that the number of deaths are following that as well. So this is Israel. Let's look at India for a second. So this is the sharp rise in Indian cases, as you can see here. And it is rapidly going up because the acceleration is high. Now, we have talked about the reason sometimes. I just want to first look at these charts. Active cases, look at it. They are going up very fast. Now, India is the second biggest um, country with the, with the infections, US being the first one. And here are the number of deaths, and they are following this as well, this pattern. So before we look at others, let me just share some of the news at the moment. So number one, vaccine continuity in India needs help. So Serum Institute is India's. Um, vaccine manufacturer. They are actually world's largest vaccine manufacturers. They are the ones that had been making 1.5 billion doses per year for the world. So you can imagine that they were feeding the world with the vaccines and they are under extra stress at this time to make the vaccines for the their own country, for India and for the rest of the world. So there was a time that the thought was that they would pump out vaccines for not only India, but others. But at this time, they are t getting um, low on the raw material. So the CEO had tweeted to Biden to help uh, lift the embargo to export raw material. So this is one interesting situation that the vaccine doses are becoming less. Somebody had uh, tweeted to me that uh, I thought that the vaccines are dwindling. So they said, no, people still at 50 and above are able to get the vaccines. It, so I do not know what is the reality. Uh, I'm sure that they're trying their best. What I have been reading and what I've been listening to is that there is a there is a scarcity of the vaccine availability. Oxygen cylinders are less as well. So that is another thing that the oxygen is uh, less. And to tell you how much hospitals are busy and under strain, that one of the cool beans talked about some medical measures for their family member. And at one point, we discussed that they might need help in the hospital. And they said, forget about that. Hospitals are just too busy at this time. Hospital beds are not available. And you can actually easily see some of the news media where you can see folks, two of them on one hospital bed. Younger population is getting more sick because the older one is either gotten sick or has gotten a uh, vaccine or has been more careful. And so the virus is figuring out that the younger population is out there and it is spreading amongst them. Ivermectin mectin is being given. So this is based on the uh, various cool beans messages. So we're going to look at that protocol in a second. This is what is concerning 300,000 new cases daily in India. So that is going up very fast. For a comparison, US, which is the top most infected country at this time, 67,000 daily new cases. And just to put it further in perspective, at some point, this pandemic had started with one person becoming infected. And then from there, it expanded to the whole world. So imagine now that we have millions infected. 
and then they are interacting with others for political campaigns or for religious reasons or for other matters just being relaxed because of the fatigue for a year whatever is the cause 300000 new daily cases in india election campaigns are continuing although the campaigns are saying that they would try to curtail the number of people for example 500 people in the campaign in one group at one time in campaigns i believe in uttar pradesh but still campaigns are continuing and then indian variant has become very much of concern i have not talked about that double mutation i've been asked many times so my apologies haven't reached there but indian variant has been a concern so there are both kinds of news that are coming out that one the uk variant or b117 has been very uh, much prevalent and that has been worldwide and that has accelerated the pandemic and now the double mutation in indian variant is also further adding to it worldwide 5.2 million new cases worldwide last one week 3 million deaths we have crossed overall worldwide now this is something that really concerns me 9 months in which 1 million people died 4 months for 1 additional million people dying so look at the acceleration look at the pace it is doubling or you can say that the number of months are really going down uh, 3 months for one more additional million people dying so if you extrapolate it i think the next one is going to be two months for one million and then would be one month for one million and so on so unless we stay careful we keep our supplement levels correct we keep our vaccination going we th there is just a lot of acceleration in this this is sad for me 25 to 50 are getting infected more so on the infection front younger population is getting now infected on the vaccine front with some vaccines the younger women population are getting affected so there is a lot of stress and strain at this time in various ways uh, india now has 15 million infections us has so far 32 million infections so see how fast india is actually increasing in infections and the reason um, i point this out is that they were actually very well controlled i actually used to uh, talk about them to say look after being such a big population they have been very very much controlled but at this time they have become one of the highest as well so this is the news roundup let me just very quickly go over uk and uh, some uh, zimbabwe as well and then we'll start having our questions so here is uk uk has kind of uh, become consistent at this level 2000 there uh, let's look at their uh, vaccination so 49.3 percent population first dose given 15 percent second dose so with 49.3 percent they were able to actually bring down this uh, infection rate and once again for those folks who who think that somehow india is vaccinated and that is still it's the failure of a vaccine please realize that india is not vaccinated to a large percentage uh, there so here if i see pakistan just on the way pakistan not reported for the vaccination yet and then india So let me just find it. India. Here. So number third from the top. 8% population. And what I have been seeing is that as the vaccination is help occurring and before 50% or below, what happens is that the pace just continues and that, that acceleration happens. It seems like it is happening with the vaccine, but really... 1% could make the whole world sick. And I'm not blaming that 1%. I'm just saying that the spread is such. And now we have a more contagious virus. And we have millions of people that are infected. So every day they're infecting more. So the pace is just going to be picked up. And then until the vaccine becomes a wall, till that time, it just continues to go faster. 
um so that is the situation so uk cases are coming down uk is how much about 49% so that is good and then the number of deaths this is excellent that they are reduced i'm hoping at some point this becomes zero and they are comfortable with this and we are all happy about that zimbabwe as you know i think have been using ivermectin mostly so their third wave has been really tiny so they have a very good control and then there is a tiny thing over there with which there is um, some deaths as well so this is the quick news review now let's look at uh pasi says ding ding why not india is not china okay so france says excellent idea thank you very much uh ding ding says do you think india is reporting their death tolls accurately i think there may be some lack in that but still even with the um, inaccuracies that may be i think that they are doing a good job but even with that there is a lot of uh, information that can be used to understand the pace at, at this time <laughs> moonshot says yeah my got my cool bean name today vision bean just don't ask why lol well, welcome to the club vision bean and for anyone who wants to have it there is a cool bean title registry link that you can use to do it okay so i'm going to see if i can answer some questions now cat b says what about those who had covid and then got pfizer what about the chance of side effects like blood clotting previous infection mild without clotting could be a protective factor they are two separate things so um i'm just thinking at this time the only protective possibility is this that as they had the previous infection when the vaccine is given the body would very quickly attack the uh, vaccine the spike proteins and quickly demolish them and that way the vaccine may not have enough chance to cause other triggering of the remaining immune system and produce new platelet factor 4 antibodies but this is just a conjecture i think that vaccine itself if somebody is susceptible to receiving the vaccine and getting the platelet factor 4 activation then they will i think get it regardless of if they had the infection before or not so care should be taken rajesh is saying more or less accurate um rajesh you are commenting on so matthew question non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs reduce cytokines how many days after vaccination will be safe to use anti inflammatory drugs so it will not interfere with vaccine is one week enough if you are concerned about it sure one week is enough cdc on their site says that even on the day of vaccination if you feel there are side effects you can take these drugs and i have discussed it sometimes as well that these drugs are not potent enough i'm talking about over the counter drugs they are not potent enough to actually interfere with the vaccine or immune systems build up if that would happen then whenever you would take these drugs when you are going through other infections then infections would just not go away because they would have these drugs would have suppressed the immune system so it, it is the same behavior here as well but if it makes you feel better that hey i want to quit it so i allow the vaccine the full uh chances then yeah sure one week is enough so khushali says for the strain in india it is observed that rt pcr is negative but rapid antigen test is positive what can be the reason so yes yeah, so this is one more uh, part of information that many of the rt pcr tests are failing on the india's strain and of course then as uh, khushali saying some are working as well here is the reason so let's say this is the spike protein and on the spike protein the test when it is built they specifically locate various parts of the spike protein or may various signals on the virus that may be two on the spike protein let me actually draw it as well instead of doing hand wavy thing so one second so let's say 
that we have this is the spike protein and i'm deliberately making it kind of in this structure and the and let's say the the virus is here this is the rest of the virus it is possible that the people who develop a test they decide that hey you know what we are going to look for this area and we'll make a specific antibody against this area then we are going to identify this area and make a specific antibody against this and maybe identify this area of the virus and make a specific antibody here maybe there is an m protein down here so now they have three signals and when they put the the patient's serum or blood and they put these antibodies on it and if these antibodies connect to these areas and then they have fluorescence on them these folks can then come back and say sure this is positive now if there are mutations which defeat this antibody binding or this binding or this binding then one or two or three signals can fail for example in the b117's case in uk the uh, it was failing one of the tests not all tests because not every manufacturer is going to target the same place every manufacturer is going to figure out where they want to target it and they're going to be slightly different so in one of the test kits in uk what they found was that it was failing for the b117 it was failing on one signal but was working on the other and they actually cleverly used that to identify this new variant similarly what's happening is that some of the test kits so let's say this is test kit 1 this is test kit 2 this is test kit 3 and the one and let's call this a b c and there are tons of more epitopes d e f g h and so on so let's say test 1 is working with a b and c a b and c test 2 is using a b and let's say f and test 3 is using a and c and g so now depending upon where the uh, mutation is some test might fail and others still work that is how these uh, test can fail or work pass is here bonjour france here at here at time as well first time for me uh um, Pasi, welcome. After a few days, Marty Smith says, "Question: Hello, Doctor Bean. Is Covaxin or Covishield safe in pregnancy? Do we have enough data available for its safety in pregnant women?" So I can't talk specifically about Covaxin, but I can talk about Pfizer because the data from uh, Israel is available, and that says it has been safe at the same time. there is data for spontaneous abortions as well after vaccines i actually want to do one complete uh, discussion about that uh, i'm cu curating that data so it seems like there is a possibility of maybe the vaccine side effects becoming severe enough to cause abortion i haven't seen that to be a just like clotting is a big concern i haven't seen any such cases where this becomes such a big concern that they say stop this vaccine is causing too much of an interference israel has been vaccinating uh, pregnant women so john says my nephew got the monoclonal antibody within one hour of check in to hospital the doctor said he had severe covid he went home that night and it is possible if the antibodies are given and given at the right time and they are Uh, i would like something like regeneron which is a cocktail of antibodies they can take care of people so fast imagine trump he went to hospital and within 2 3 days he was out and uh, doing hand waving things with the public <laughs> and then uh, giuliani so these cocktails are very useful as well if given at the right time Ding Ding says, "Do you think we will see more aggressive fatal variants of COVID-19?" So I have done this discussion before. There are two, there are three ways, actually more than that. So let me do this. Uh, I'm going to draw this to explain that should we get this or not. So let's say here is the virus A. Let's call it the parent virus. 
So this virus is the parent one came from someplace wherever. Let's say in our case here, it came from Wuhan. Parent virus, when in one person it is replicating, it is dividing in them, it can actually become so. And let's say this parent virus has these spike proteins that are really important for its function. And it gave off a progeny, a, a daughter, which doesn't have the correct spike proteins. So now this baby or this new, new variant will actually die within this cell, within this person, because the spike proteins are not capable of attaching to the ACE2. So it cannot really perform its function correctly, and it would not be going any further. Let's say it also created another version, which is really an aggressive version. And this is able to connect, connect with more affinity. Let's say like UK variant B117 or B135 or other variants, P1 Manas. So this was able to connect with more affinity. And let's say, so here is the first thing to consider. When it is connecting with more affinity in the person where this got developed, it would start doing the same thing within that person as well and possibly bring that person uh, to the bed. And so they would have less chance to sh shedding and spreading, or uh, it can even cause death. But let's say from that person, somehow it got shed out because the person didn't yet become sick enough. And it went into the next person. Now, the next person who received it, what would happen is that they will quickly become sick with this variant. Of course, we're calling that this is more, let's say, fatal. Now, rapid trans transmission is a different thing. Being fatal is a different thing. So let's say this is more fatal. So that means this person would immediately or quickly die. So when the person has died quickly, this person would have lesser chance to, um, to make others sick. So this virus is going to die with these folks who it made fatally sick very fast. So automatically, the spread will reduce. So when a virus becomes more deadly or a bacteria becomes more deadly, then it becomes a little less uh, contagious. And not because it cannot transmit. It's just that people are becoming sick and they are not going out and they are just sick at home or in hospitals. So they have lesser chances of spreading it. Now, let's say there is one more variant here that has figured out, let's say like UK or Manaus or South Africa or double mutations in India. I shouldn't talk about double mutation in India without knowing more about it. So my apologies, I do not know more about it yet. So let's say this is a new virus. And this virus has a special mutation on its spike protein, which allows it to bind even more successfully. So now what would happen is, and and let's say it is less lethal. It does not replicate that much. It just binds very quickly and enters the cells very much. When it enters in the cell, it does not cause the cell to be too much bothered. And it does not uh, cause too much of immune issues. So somehow it is more friendly, but more contagious. This kind of a virus will have a chance to spread faster to many, many people. Why? Because it is not making them sick. It is just going from one person to the next person to the next person. They are not becoming sick. They're roaming around in the, in the society and they're continuing to spread it to others. That is what we are seeing in many, many cases. So in theory, from a mechanism point of view, from a concept point of view, when a virus becomes more contagious, becoming more contagious means it has to become less lethal, otherwise it cannot keep spreading. When a virus becomes more lethal, then that would mean that it will the spread would reduce because people would start dying and becoming severely ill. Now, uh, some folks would respond to this and say, you know what, but this virus has a silent window of five days in which when it is present in a person, for five days it would actually keep multiplying in them keep shedding and they would not even know and the people around them would not know. So now it is a more contagious virus which is going out and infecting more people. But here's the deal. 
the contagiousness of the virus or when it is spreading, sorry, not contagious, uh, contagious, the infectiousness, the, when it is spreading to others is usually two days before the symptoms. So here, let's say there are symptoms here. So two days before the symptoms is where usually the person has started shedding. Before that, the virus is building up and it is not sufficient in quantity to shed yet. Now, if we suspect that we are talking about a virus which is contagious, more contagious, it actually infects more um, cells and becomes divided fast, then this window have, has to shrink as well. It would not stay five days and the person would not continue to shed for five days person will become infected and will very rapidly develop symptoms, sometimes overnight. You meet someone with COVID with the new variants today and tomorrow you're sick. You're showing symptoms, so, so, such a fast way of causing the disease. So in that case, the person, if, it, if they become severely ill, they're not going to be spreading around for five days because there is a silent window. That window is going to be compressed as well. So there has to be a proportional behavior over here. So uh, sometimes when I think about those variants who are that are spreading fast, one of the thing is this window is still dangerous, but it gets compressed as well. So one of the thing is that are they reducing the lethal uh, lethality of the virus? And I would then counter my point with Oxford's study where or the UK study where they had done a study in the outdoor community. I discussed it as well, where they said that the UK's B117 variant has not only been more contagious, that means spreads more, but is 30% or more lethal as well compared to the wild type. So my own points, counterpoint is what I'm sharing with you as well, is seen in a study. Colin Hamel says, is it possible there is a new viral outbreak in India not related? Possible, but I think that they're doing RT-PCRs, they're doing other tests as well, and they see that this is uh, SARS-CoV-2. Gaurav Shah says, can the new Indian virus dodge the immunity gained by a previous COVID-19 infection? If so, then how will the vaccine work on it? So Gaurav, very good question. And same kind of an, an answer as we gave for, for this. Just like a virus can escape by mutation, some tests. Imagine if this was not really the test, it was our body's immune system making antibodies against various parts of the virus. And then the virus made changes to those parts. And now those antibodies are unable to bind from the previous infection. The antibodies generated are unable to bind to those parts because they are mutated. Then, of course, the new variant will be able to escape the previous infection. However, this is an important aspect to realize that the virus when we receive the actual virus. So let's say this is the actual virus, really angry dude over here. And has, we know that it has spike proteins, then it has M proteins, then it has N proteins that are nucleocapsid proteins. It has messenger RNA, then it has a bunch of other uh, cell lipids, membranes, and so on. And we will produce antibodies against a majority of these areas. So when a new variant will arrive, majority of the new variant, for example, current variants are, I think, 0.3% different compared to the original wild type. Comparing SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, there is, I think, 14% difference. They are 86% similar. Here, the variants are... 99.3% similar, or what should it be? 0.3% difference, so 99.7% similar. The, the difference is really 18 amino acids or 7 amino acids, so they are a tiny difference. Significant dif difference because it is on the spike proteins, and virus would continue to try that. But this difference is not sufficient yet to make it escape. What would happen is possibly somebody can become 
sick with the new uh, variant, but they would not develop severe enough disease because their body would just attack it and uh, control it fast. And please remember that when a virus would appear, which is a variant, and the person was infected with a different strain uh, variant before, these antibodies from the previous um, memory cells, these would start attacking the virus, and those parts which are, let's say, changed, they would go through the regular process of invoking the immune system, and so the naive T cells would bind here, not here on the virus, but we know the process, virus going into the cell, getting chopped up, then presented on the um, MHC1 or MHC2, then naive T cell would come and bind there, and then those naive T cell would start the immune system pathway. So those would still happen, and we would develop the immunity as we regularly do. It would take two weeks or so. So I hope that answers that question. Um, Doug Gross says, uh, Pfizer Israeli data shows that vaccine protects against all of the side effects, lower incidence than background. And yes, that is the, uh, when David and I had been logged in about half an hour before, or maybe an hour before, and we were going over the same data and we were chit chatting. And one thing that I was uh, thinking aloud with David was, it is weird for me to think this way. So let me show you what is weird. So let's say, 2017 to 20, and this may be just, I was trying to figure out where the data or how to interpret that data. So let's say something, some symptom X. In 2017 to 2019, they studied the same population, number of people, similar window of time, and they said, well, this is expected, let's say 35 in 1 million. And then those who are vaccinated, let's say dose one, they said, this is 0 0.6 in 1 million. So that, Did you try again? that is series everywhere and Alexa's. So, so here, if you see this 35, if it is expected and it is happening then some number should be here as well, which is near 35. So if we say, what I did not understand was, was this 0 0.6 in addition to this 35? So what they're saying that 35 plus 0 0.6, but as you saw their commentary that they said, it does not go over the expected. So this may be not the case. If that is not the case, then are we saying that vaccinated folks actually had lesser of some symptom and is that just because they're vaccinated and this is just a population not not really extrapolate or comparable or did vaccine actually improve the situation which i would doubt so this is a part of um, data which is still not clear to me and because it is a language barrier as well i can't just freely go and research and figure out the answers Uh, Colin says, can antibodies be tested to see what way they are trying to fight a pathogen and make an educated guess how to help? Yes. Yeah, so if, for example, as we said, some tests get uh, negative results, that means those antibodies are not helping. So one can take, this is the T cell test as well. Similarly, we can do B cell test as well. Many times the researchers actually take somebody's plasma, patient's plasma, then they put those antibodies on it and see how they are working. And that is how they assess the presence and efficacy and titrations and potency of the antibodies. So yes, this is a correct way of doing things. Um, can it be done for everyone? That is a problem. I think they're not doing it. Moonshot says, Dr. Mubin, FLCC, Dr. Chris Martinson are my go-to people with this. Chris has his website park. A peak prosperity while we're checking out hard assets. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Shashi Kant says, person with high COVID IgG antibody, 150 to 200 AU per ml, can they get vaccine? So I did a uh, study discussion a few weeks ago, I believe, where I discussed that people who had been infected then and they had antibodies, some of them had antibodies, and then they got the vaccine as well. And that increased their vaccine, their antibody production, because the challenge came. And then they got even the second dose, and that did not do much more difference. So the conclusion was that one dose would actually help boost the system. In my opinion, that really is not the boosting of the system. It is just that either we have the infection or the vaccine. Our immune system is now ready. So when the challenge appears in the form of the vaccine second dose, or in the form of infection again, our body would immediately get ready and start producing antibodies. And they, it would start releasing them. So measuring them to say, well, this causes the antibodies to increase is not the right conclusion. The right conclusion is when the challenge would occur, body would respond. Now, would that help if you take another vaccine dose? Some folks have said who are in long hauling state that it has helped. And then doctors have been saying everyone should get it, infection or not. My opinion is they don't need it if they have antibodies. But uh, CDC, WHO, all of those organizations are saying that please go. Even doctors are saying go take the vaccine even after the infection. Liza says, how far these mutations can go? If they are mutations mutating so fast, your thoughts as a pro proactive scholar knowing virology history. Thank you, Lisa. So let me just very quickly, how how do these mutations work actually? Let's see. So here, if we go back to this discussion, these mutations that are happening. So this guy got mutated enough that it is going to, the, the new virus is going to die. So there are going to be mutations that would be sufficient enough and drastic enough that the virus would just die. It cannot propagate further. Then there can be mutations that would be drastic enough to make the virus mild enough for us to live friendly in a friendly way with us and live on forever. Uh, then there can be mutations that are probably in the middle, not so drastic that the virus is disabled to do its function, not so friendly, the virus cannot cause the disease that much. And then they, there is a balance then that how long can it go? So it really is uh, that if this virus, for example, if I make one more over here and say that the virus learned to connect instead of using, using ACE2, it learned to connect using some other receptor. Or the virus learned to not cause infection through the respiratory tract, but let's say through the GIT now or this virus already knows GIT, or some other path, or skin, then this will become a new either genotype, gen genetic change, drastic change, plus or negative phenotype. And that is too different. Phenotype is this the shape and function of it. And that is too different from the original parent that we would then say, this is a new strain. This is a new virus now. Let's say this is a SARS-CoV-3 and then it would have its own pandemic. So uh, Liza, to answer your question, how far can this go? It can go pretty far. And that's what we're saying, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2. So can there be a SARS-CoV-3? Yes. Is there a SARS-CoV-3 yet? No. <clears throat> so Jess Stark says, uh, question, Jolly Bean here. Hello, Jolly Bean. Doctor, to your knowledge, has anyone tried hyperbaric oxygen treatment for the disease, cures ganglies and other difficult issues very well? So I'm very aware of the hyperbaric because one of my uh, friends uh, runs a hyperbaric center in Dubai. So I do not know if she has tried it. I would ask her. Uh, so other than that, I'm not aware of anyone else using it. But I know the efficacy of hyper hyperbaric is very good, Chambers. Uh, Hushali says, so let's take another five minutes and then I'll break for my next meeting. Hushali says, what is the role of plasma therapy in COVID? 
Many studies show that it is not useful, but still we are prescribing it. AIMS guidelines show that convalescent plasma therapy can be given. So this is like we throwing everything at the virus. If the plasma has enough antibodies, if those antibodies are of the right type to bind with the new virus at the right places of the virus, and if the virus is enough, if the phase of the person who is receiving the plasma therapy is in viral kind of a phase, then plasma can help. So this is why you would see some patients plasma will work, some patients it will not work because both persons state and infection and antibody levels and antibody shapes and the presence of the virus, they both will matter. This is why plasma becomes a hit and a miss. So sometimes it works very well and sometimes it does not work. Um, if I am there, I would try everything plasma other than a chance of an allergic reaction, which blood matching and typing should uh, rule out. Uh, I would try these things as well for the patient if available. And I had promised that I would look into this as well. Maybe we do not have sufficient time to go over this, but let's see. So this is the AIMS New Delhi's protocol. So COVID-19 patient, mild disease, upper respiratory tract, upper respiratory tract symptoms and or fever without shortness of breath. So what are they suggesting? Home isolation, symptomatic management, that means aspirin or panadols or painkillers or antipyretics. Seek immediate medical attention if difficulty in breathing, high grade fever, low threshold should be kept for patients. So in this, they are giving tablet ivermectin 200 microgram per kilogram once a day for three to five days, may be considered in patients with high risk features. So I like this, that they're saying, okay, stay home, but take ivermectin during this time. Steroids should not be used in patients with only mild disease. And this is where, and they're correct here. I am of the same opinion, but I'm seeing so many doctors st starting steroids in the early time as well, and then thinking or saying that hey, it works. So high risk patients definition is here. So here, ivermectin at home. This is much better than us, for example, in the US saying, just go home and wait for the shortness of breath and good luck. If you don't get it, be happy. If you get it, come to hospital. That's just, just not right. Anyways, here is a moderate disease. Respiratory rate greater, greater than or equal to 24. Normally it's about 18. Uh, that is 18 breath per minute. So if it has gone more than 24 or about 24 and more, that means body's uh, struggling and person has to breathe more or uh, respire more to be able to get enough oxygen. And oxygen level is dropping below 94 on the room air, meaning they're not getting any oxygen supplements. And here, come back to the hospital, get admitted in the ward. And what are they doing then? Giving oxygenation awake proning, so putting the patient in the prone position. I actually do this prone position here as well. In the home isolation, when I talk with the patient, starting them when the supplements on the medicines, I ask them to do as much proning as they can. I ask them to prone every half an hour. So I don't even wait them to go to the hospital and start proning. Um, antiviral therapy, remdesivir, which may or may not be used, but again, the thing is, this is one of the tools. Uh, convalescent plasma, same answer as I just said before as well. It is one of the tools. It will work on some, not work on others. Anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory therapies, methylprednisolone or dexamethasol. So they look, they prefer methylprednisolone, which is mask plus uh, protocol. So I like it. It is more mask plus math plus protocol combination, although it has some things missing. And that just tells us that some doctors are not very much fond of supplements and vitamins and others it kind of think that as a um, not a great science. So <clears throat> anticoagulants, low dose prophylactic, low molecular weight heparin, enoxaparin. And we have talked about all of these drugs in our mass plus math plus uh, discussions. So if you wanted to understand the mechanism, you can see that monitoring clinical mon monitoring. So that is the second thing here. Again, what I am missing here is things like melatonin, high dose ascorbic acid, vitamin D correction, and th those kind of things are missing here. But still, 
methylprednisolone instead of uh, dexamethasone, which is a good thing. I had thought that they should have uh, continued with ivermectin, hydroxy, zinc, or maybe zinc and quercetin if you don't believe in hydroxy or the patient cannot take it. Those things should have been here as well. Ivermectin has shown to be effective in this stage too. Now, severe disease, respira respiratory rate greater than 30 or oxygen level lesser than 90 at the room temperature. Admit in the ICU. So here, let's see, other than the high flow nasal oxygen, uh, caution NIV with helmet interface. So that is the oxygen help uh, ARDS protocol. So the standard protocol in the um, in the ICU to help with the ARDS antiviral therapy may be considered if duration of illness is lesser than 10 or because what they're thinking is are they is the patient still in the viral phase or they have gone into cytokine storm anti-inflammatory. So they are still giving methylprednisolone or dexamethasone to silizumab. So that is an IL-6 blocker, which is good. Anticoagulants, they're continuing on with the uh, with the molecular weight, heparin, maintain euvolemia. So this would be the most difficult thing for them to do. How do they keep the patient dry enough that the fluid does not accumulate in the lungs, but wet enough that the link, uh, the um, the kidneys are working fine and the oxygen delivery and nutritional del delivery of perfusion is correct. Very difficult thing. I salute ICU doctors who try these balances moment to moment and work on it. And then they said, monitor these things. So once again, high dose ascorbic acid, vitamin D, uh, zinc, quercetin, ivermectin, these are all useful at these stages as well. I would have wished to add Regeneron at all of these stages. And that would have been, well, in the cytokine stage, maybe not that much, but in all viral stages, Regeneron would be helpful as well. So um, I hope this is useful. Um, So ditching the grind says praying US and WHO approve ivermectin across the board and educate doctors on using it to tra transmit COVID. I wish to, it is so sad ditching the grind that we have reached a point of now we have to pray for these organizations to do the science. And ideally they are science based organizations. They should do the science. And here we are. And again, I'm not against praying. Praying is important. I'm just angry at their, uh, behavior. So with this, let's see if we can stop here today. Um, and we will continue tomorrow. Uh, some of the cool beans, we would continue to see each other this evening as well. So please like, subscribe and share the, the minimum you can do to help me back is to like the video that allows uh, YouTube to figure out that this is something may be useful for others too. And so then they would spread it. If you don't want this to spread, then you can dislike it. That would help as well <laughs> to reduce the spread. And in addition to that, if you would like to support this work and since the YouTube demonetization, we have started needing support. If you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. One is for buying me a coffee where you can don't need to use PayPal. Another one is to become a patron. And one more is to use PayPal to support this work. I am working to get the uh, uh, nonprofit org set up as well. And that would probably help too. So thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow or some of you this evening. Bye-bye.